Thank you for joining PCR Planet. PCR Planet is where we gather news from colleagues and peers from all over the world. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Felix Mafoud. He's from Hamburg Saar University Hospital. As you know, Felix has been chairing the resistant hypertension course and, and is very active in PCR courses. And I'm also delighted to invite uh, Dr. Nicole Karam from Paris, Georges Pompidou Hospital. And Nicole is, is one of the leaders of our next generation group. So I'll start maybe with Nicole. Tell us in a few words, uh, how is the situation in Paris? I think you went through very difficult times, didn't you? Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for having me first. And uh, yes, to come back to the situation, it's, it has been very tough. I mean, we are at a decline phase, let's say. So we had the big wave coming in the last month. Uh, we had lots of patients coming over. We have to switch our, uh, we had to switch our almost our entire activity to take care of COVID. But now we feel that like we, we are at the end of this uh, of this of this big wave. We are still on a uh, plateau, but uh, it's the situation is much much better now. And so yourself, you've been you've been busy both uh, as a cardiologist, as an interventional cardiologist, but they also called upon you to to be to serve on the ICU and, and to take care of COVID patients? Yeah, so let's say as an interventional cardiologist, I've been less busy than usual because we had to, to cancel lots of uh, scheduled interventions, uh, structural or coronary, and mainly focus on emergencies. Uh, and we've had a lot of these emergencies. So I had to work on COVID patients and do angiograms on patients because they often have uh, elevations of troponin or AKG modifications. So I had to work on those patients. And so it's an entire switch in, on, in the kind of in the type of patients we were dealing with. And during the night shifts and the call in the ICU, in the CCU, I also had to see patients who were in the COVID units and who needed some uh, cardiology consultations. Thank you. And on your side, Felix, I think we spoke, what is it, two weeks ago, and that was the moment of calm before the storm. But a lot has happened since then. Can you, can you summarize that for us, what an experience it has been? Yeah, well, um, we prepared ourselves here um, for the wave uh, of COVID patients that we um, did not see in the amount we expected to see it. So that was uh, fortunate. I think um, um, now we have flattened the curve. We still see patients that are really sick uh, that are treated with ARDS on our intensive care unit. But overall, um, all the measures that we implemented appeared to work. So the curve is flattened indeed. And we're picking up now our routine care. So all the elective procedures that we postponed during the um, crisis. Um, uh, are now coming back again to our institution and we're seeing patients for elective, so-called elective non-urgent procedures, PCI, valve implantations and other uh, interventional mm -hmm. procedures. And that's quite demanding because we now see COVID positive patients and we see patients that we want to prevent from the infection. Mm -hmm. So that's quite um, a challenging organizational issue. So a new, a new organizational challenge after, you know, dealing with, with the previous one. I just want to come back for a moment to the period where it was calm. Of course, Hamburg Saar is close to the, uh, to the, to the border, French border, and you were very close to the east, of course, where the pandemic has been very severe. So uh, um, I want, I want you to, to tell us a bit about uh, the decision that you have made with your team to actually treat and transfer patients uh, coming from France. Yeah, so we are uh, 20 kilometers away from the French border and uh, the region Grand Est really suffered. Uh, they were overwhelmed by patients and in Fourbach, which is uh, very close to Saarbrücken, which is our capital indeed, and Strasbourg, for instance, Mulhus, uh, they were really, uh, they had really difficulties in treating very sick patients, so uh, we felt it was important to take these patients on our intensive care unit. So they were transferred many by helicopter from France to our intensive care unit and have been treated here. Some of them were sent home again. Some of them are still being treated here, but I think that's an important sign also, a sign of neighborhood assistance, which is indeed crucial in these difficult times. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So I'm turning to Nicole again. Um, you you also are in a position where you're going to restart some of your elective or relatively elective activity while at the same time, you know, caring of COVID plus patients. How do you see this um, going forward um, practically? So now we are exactly at the point where we are trying to organize this uh, this uh, activity. It will be very difficult and we will have to be very careful from one side to avoid infecting our not so urgent patients and also to reassure the patients because lots of them don't feel like coming to the hospital and taking the risk of being infected. So in an organi organizational point of view, it's a very tough issue. We are trying at the beginning, we had split our activity and used some of the rooms of the cath lab for COVID patients, some others for COVID free patients. And we did the same with the hospitalizations board. And now it will be very difficult to make sure that the patients, because we weren't bringing the patients to the hospital, but now that we are doing this, we'll have to make sure that they won't get infected. So we'll have to probably test more patients and be more careful on seeing, on finding those patients who are, who are supposed to be COVID free, but were actually infected. So we are working yeah. on that too. At the same time, uh, I think it's it's becoming urgent to yes. deal with you know the backlog mm -hmm. of patients. I think um, mm -hmm. uh, some colleagues have mentioned that they have seen um, late late presenters, you know, all sorts of of yeah. uh, disease presentations that you you would not see mm -hmm. uh, normally in normal yeah. circumstances. That's right. You, you have, is that your experience as well? That's our experience, and that's why we are having the feeling that it's becoming that we pushed our limits. I mean, we we have rescheduled lots of procedures, but now we see that this is the time where we have to resume our activities. I mean, we've had one death in, in our waiting list for tabers. I mean, it was a sudden death, so we never know when those happen. But now we know we have also we had also patient coming back for heart failure because they are waiting for a mitral clip or for a mitral, pre a mitral intervention. So we know that now it's time to resume those activities. So there are the two types of late presenters. We have the valvular procedures that we postponed, but we also have the patients who are the urgency, the emergencies who the, that doesn't come. And this is something we were shocked about at the beginning of this wave. When we started seeing late comers of STEMI who were coming with complication, mechanical complications that we hadn't seen for years. I mean. In the same week, I saw a left ventricular wall rupture, a interventricular septal rupture, the cardiogenic shock, the papillary muscle rupture. So all these mechanical complications that we we hadn't seen this often in the last years, and now we are having all those patients. So I guess it is time to resume the activity. We know we are maybe bringing patient, taking the risk of infection, but we have to to be prepared and to resume the activity. Mm -hmm. And these are, if I may, if I may say that, William, these are these are COVID victims too. I mean, they are obviously not mm -hmm. infected, but as they fear to get an infection while being in hospital, they are not mm -hmm. showing up for a procedure. They are not showing up because of of symptoms, chest pain, yeah. dyspnea, whatsoever. So, you know, to some extent, these are also patients that die because of the pandemic, although they have not been infected. And it will be very interesting to see the statistics at the end. How many mm -hmm. patients die from cardiovascular diseases that would probably not have died in case the pandemic would not, you know, have distracted them from coming to the hospital? Mm. Uh, well, we did this kind of work to try to see who were the, what's, what's happening in Paris a little bit. And we were surprised to see that we had almost a doubling in the rate of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah. So probably there are some COVID in those patients, but most likely there are lots of patients who should have been in our hospital during yeah. these times and who weren't. I don't know if you had the same experience, but we almost have, haven't seen much patients during, uh, much STEMI patients during this period. Yeah. I mean, we had like a 75% it's reduction in STEMI rates. Significantly decreased here too. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Felix, let me let me ask you a bit about your your both of you, and and, and certainly in, in your environment, you're passionate about research, and you have many many patients enrolled in trials and ongoing trials. Um, how to deal with it? When do you think you can start enrolling again? Um, it seems like a, a difficult uh, equation to solve, right? Absolutely, very challenging. Uh, I think the, the, this has a couple of dimensions. One is that we stopped recruitment 
of course, in the in the uh, trials and most of the trials that we're doing here at our institution. But we have recruited patients and we randomized patients that had scheduled a visit, a follow-up visit during the pandemic. And it was very unclear whether or not we're allowed to see these patients for scientific purposes in the hospital during the shutdown. So, you know, that will be challenging for data interpretation at the end, particularly when it's when the outcome, the primary outcome is not related to death or alive, but to a continuous variable such as heart rate, blood pressure, six minute walking distance, an echo imaging, you know, then we have really issues that later on when we interpret the trials that were enrolling patients during this difficult period, we will see loss to follow ups and we will have to handle all these um, mm -hmm. these lacks in, in, in the database and uh, we need some guidance. I think that's uh, that's very important at the moment. So we need guidance not only from FDA and EMA, which has been published already, but we need guidance from the community, from clinical researchers, how we should deal with this scientifically, but also from an interpretation perspective, from a publishing perspective, from an analyzing perspective, and how we deal with these patients that are enrolled in trials. Certainly what I can say from our side now is that we are seeing these patients again. I think that we have a responsibility also ethically for patients that have been randomized in a sham controlled or in a, in, a, in a controlled trial, in a randomized controlled trial. So we have a responsibility for these patients too. And I think we have to take it very serious and to do everything possible to get these patients in hospital, of course, with all the standards that we're applying now here. But um, it's it's really challenging and I'm curious to see how other sites are handling this issue um, during uh, this difficult time. Mm -hmm. well, would you agree with with a statement like this that, you know, let's resume activity clinically only first. And once we, you know, we have a couple weeks or maybe a couple months or two of, of normal activity streamlined, then restart including and rolling in trials? Or do you I think, think uh, you want to yeah. be more aggressive and restart as soon as possible? So I think that depends locally on um, the measures that are, are being taken. So here the social distancing, so the shops are opened again since Monday and we're expecting to see more patients because our zero will go up. That's at least what our epidemiologists are telling us. I think we have to wait for a couple of more weeks to see how things are going, but um, surely, but slowly, but surely, I think we have to pick up research activities as well, mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. in conditions where research is really crucial. I mean, if we do research activities that, you know, are important, not only scientifically, but also clinically for patients, I think we have good reasons to continue research in these um, uh, circumstances as well. Well, thank you. These are very thoughtful um, uh, considerations and thank you for sharing them. Um, we're going to bring this uh, nice conversation to uh, to an end, but before doing that, I'd like to thank you for, you know, sharing your experience and, and everything you told us. Um, to finish, uh, maybe Nicole, uh, first, uh, would you have a key statement or something you really want us to remember or something, some personal experience that, that you would like to share with, with the colleagues? I mean, what, what I would like to share is what, what I've been thinking about during these last few weeks. So I guess this experience will be a very, very humbling experience because what, we, what we've learned is that we are not this, this almighty and that all the system that we know can just vanish in like a few, few, few hours. I mean, one day we come to the hospital, we're working normally and the next day nothing is the same. So it's humbling, but it's also interesting to see how how able we are to adjust to new situations and how things can turn positive if we do it. So it's always been like a, the major quality of the human being. And I guess we just proved that we are still able to adjust and still able to work, even though it's very humbling to see that we have very, very sharp limits. Thank you, a great message. Felix, yourself? Well, um, this whole pandemic nicely showed us how fragile our environment is and um, how connected we are indeed um, we're getting through this i'm very sure 
we will get stronger out of it as we got in. And um, it will be an, a challenging time. It was a challenging time, and it will be challenging in the near future, I'm very sure. But uh, if we stand together, we'll make it, and um, we'll make the best out of it, and in uh, particular, we'll make the best out for our patients. Well, um, thank you so much for joining, and I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for listening, and uh, let's stay connected. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, William. <laughs>